Trump wanted to be the security guy. He claimed he was a security guy. Welcome to another eclectic version. God, what the hell does that mean? Eclectic version of Security Guy Radio. I'm Chuck. Take it on the chin, Harold. And this is Paul Tally Ho. No, Bristow. no, it's yes. Paul. You bet your bippy, Bristo. <laughs> and for all the uh, young people out there, go uh, Google L- Rowan and Martin's Laughing and Goldie Hawn, and you'll understand uh, <laughs> what that reference is. Oh boy, That's, well uh, that dates you actually. It does. Well, I have white hair mm-hmm. for a reason, obviously. Not, one that of the he, not that he listens. What was our what was our one of our first mottos? Welcome to Security Guy Radio, where we give you free security advice because no one will pay us for it <laughs> anymore, right? Or welcome to Security Guy Radio, where guard is a verb, not a noun. Yes, that's true too. We're going to uh, talk about domestic violence today from a victim's perspective. Uh, we've talked about this before. Stats and yeah. the cost. It's just it's overwhelming. Enormous. Yeah, it's it's un- it's unbelievable what what this costs society, and our guest today is going to kind of talk about what the triggers are involved in this and look at another way to kind of help help fix that. Uh, so here's some stats from um, let's see oh oh the Bureau of uh, Judicial Statistics dot gov um, gender okay so of course females are more likely than males to experience uh, non fatal intimate partner violence. And on average, uh, non-fatal intimate partner victimizations represented 22% of all non-fatal victims were female ages 12 or older. 4% of non-fatal violent uh, victimizations against males were age 12 and older. Mm. So big difference. So males are still in there, 4%. You know, it's kind of interesting. I wonder if that's increasing. I'd like to see those numbers over the years. It's hard to say. I mean, you know, these stats are always several years behind, right? But uh, have to do a bit of research on it. We'll get back to you on another broadcast. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Victim offender relationship and non fatal violent victimizations uh, by victim and gender show that, uh, and this is an interesting one. Annual uh, average annual rate per one thousand persons, age twelve or older. Okay, so if we have a victim offender relationship that's intimate, for female the rate is four point two. of occurrences and 21 percent of all occurrences hmm. or uh, if it's another relative it's 1.7 uh, rate and 8.9 percent of all occurrences friend acquaintances account for 36 percent and a stranger is 33 now that's interesting yeah a stranger is is higher than intimate that's kind of weird right is yeah, that, am i reading that correctly state. no you're reading it correctly yeah which doesn't make sense to me to be quite honest stranger well that you know what that's because our stocking stats have kind of gone up a little bit, right? Yeah. People are, are now recording stocking more than they used to. Yeah. Stocking kind of went kind of went unrecorded. Uh, for homicides, let's see, percent of homicides by gender. All right, so let's say of, of uh, intimate relationship, 30% are female homicide victims, 5.3% male. Yeah. So that's, that's not unexpected. Other family members for homicide rate, uh, 11% are female and 6.7 percent now look at how close that gets so if you have an intimate relationship the man's going to kill the wife before the wife's going to kill the man yeah. let's say other family member though it's closer so a brother yeah that's interesting kills yeah. you know the female and that's 11.7 percent and if it's a male it's 6.7 percent yeah, yeah. So it's much closer together an acquaintance again interesting an acquaintance relationship has a higher appearance of homicides than a family member yeah all right, so we uh, have 21% for females are murdered by acquaintances or known person. But look at the males. The males are 35% because what? What do we have? We have testosterone. We have alcohol. Yeah, we have pop, drugs. You know, you, yeah. Yeah, you stole my girlfriend, whatever, right? So that, can, that makes sense. Stranger uh, homicide is, is down. Uh, so that's 8% for females and about 15% for males. And undetermined, I don't I don't know why under yeah, tw- well, twenty some percent female. Well, they don't know who it is, right? Yeah. No, I guess so. Or thirty yeah. f- percent for me. So that would be a stranger. Well, you don't know. No, it didn't you say stranger because stranger right? was up above. It's just undetermined yeah. for some reason. Uh, ages uh, for female victims uh, again. In our last study, we read uh, it reported that you know the twenty twenty to twenty four. Yeah, and, and here we're saying that females ages thirty five to forty nine 
for a greater risk of non-fatal intimate partner inter, intimate partner violence yeah. uh, than other females. So, if you look at the 20 to 24 age group, where there's the greatest risk for uh, the violence, uh, that is the non-fatal side. So I guess it looks like if you get older, you're going to get murdered, and if you're younger, you're going to get beat up. Uh, it's yeah, kind of what it reads like, right? Well, you you know, things are a lot more volatile, right? Yeah, it's, it's longer. It's, yeah, goes longer. Yeah. And people, you know, people get uh, more tired. People, of you know, get. I mean, you do tend to get into more arguments the uh, the younger you are, right? Right. As, as you as you get older, and I think probably the arguments are more severe as you get older. And yeah. They're about a lot. You know, they're about more important things as you get older. Exactly. I find. I mean, I don't get into yeah. arguments now. But if I do, then it's going to be something that's really important to me. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I'm not a yeah. Who the hell knows? Marital status. How <laughs> does that affect domestic violence? Uh, let's see. Rates of non-fatal intimate partner violence for females who are married, divorced, separated, or never married, uh, were as follows. So it looks like if you're if you're married, uh, the rate of per one thousand uh, does go up. Now, interesting. If you're divorced or never married, it goes down. Yeah. According to the statistic, well, I mean, you're, you're probably, you know, but the most highest appearance is if you're separated. Look at that. Yeah. There's the volatility. Oh yeah, right well there. that makes sense. So okay. in the separation phase, we're having the highest appearances of domestic yeah. violence, as opposed to being divorced. And, and that married. goes with everything that we've been talking about. Yeah, that's very you know, interesting. Domestic violence. So there's the dangerous period yeah. where people are breaking up. They're not sure yeah. how to define the relationship yeah. or what what they're going to do. Um, yeah, separated is way high. Now look at look at the separated number for females. You're looking at. Um, Rate per thousand is about forty-five. Yeah. Males goes down a little lower. Uh, race, uh, it, it kind of it's kind of seems to be kind of even to me. Uh, white females three point one percent. I'm sorry, three point one per thousand. Black females four point six per thousand. Yeah, it's more or less the same. Isn't it? More white males seven point seven per thousand. So that we find we knew that in law enforcement, yeah. right? That if you're a victim of domestic violence, it's not race driven. No. Uh, it just cuts across all kinds of different areas. Now economics, though may drive it, right? Depending on household incomes and things like that. Uh, they break down Hispanic origin uh, to see if there's a difference there. You know, you say economics may drive it. I mean, I've seen domestic violence in, you know, right right across the, the board, really. You know, I mean, it, it te- I think it tends to happen more the less money you're, uh, you're earning, but you, you see it everywhere. I mean, it's not, it's not something. To, I think... What does happen is the more money you earn, or the higher up you are in the in the, in that status, uh, the less chance it is of law enforcement actually responding and doing something. You don't think so? I don't think so. Well, we'll get into that in a minute. We have yeah, some. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, here's an average annual non-fatal intimate partner victimization by rate, uh, by race and gender. So, white males is a victim low, zero point eight. Black males 1.4, Asian females 1.4, white females 4.0, black females 5.0, American Indian males 5.3. But look at this: American Indian females 11.1 uh, occurrences per thousand. Yeah. Way above the other ones. That's very interesting. Hispanic origin uh, tends to be trending down in numbers uh, for that. Income. Now, this I think is kind of. Uh, well, this is what we were just talking about. Right? Yeah. Here we go. All right. Let's so see if I was right. Average annual non-fatal intimate partner victimization rate by income and gender. So if you have a household income of less, well, let's start at the top. Does that make more sense? Let's say your income is above $50,000 or more. You have uh, less than five occurrences per thousand from for females and what's that? I mean, it's like one occurrence per yeah, male, right? Yeah, yeah. But if you go down to like $7,500 so right, for income, and this is obviously poverty level, it goes up way up. Right, you're you're looking at uh, 12, 14 uh, occurrences per thousand for female victims, and the males even go up too. So I think it does drive. But uh, but I do get back to the reporting. I mean, uh, the more money you earn, you're probably not reporting this stuff. You're not reporting. Right? Makes it's a lot of sense. Not getting reported because you have other resources. So, yeah. So I, you know, I I really think that that's a skew with number. Yeah. Home ownership, uh, lower appearances of uh, domestic violence, rented properties, higher appearances. Mm. Of domestic violence sense, per right? thousand. Yeah. yeah, it's almost, it's almost triple. Yeah, owner versus uh, rented. Now, children exposed. I think this is the most important thing. So, if we look at a percentage uh, 
of all households. Uh, we're looking at uh, 615. What was that? Households? Households. Households. All right. Homes. <laughs> domiciles, all right? Okay. So all domiciles uh, with 615,000 children representing the 100%, okay? So of the 615,000, these households, uh, 32%, I'm sorry, 35% had children. 49% had no children. Mm. Now that's kind of interesting because so children can sometimes be a stressor for all kinds yeah. of reasons, right? Uh, and unknown, again, this unknown, 15%. Female victim households, uh, a total 100% number of 510,000. Of that number, uh, 38% had children, 46% uh, had children, had no children. No children. Yeah. And then male victims, you know, in households, uh, of course, that's less that there's a single dad, so to speak, right? Yeah. Uh, 21% had children, and 64% had no children in these households. That's interesting. Where a male was the victim. Yeah. But that is interesting. That goes way up. I wonder yeah. why that is. I don't know. But that is an interesting stat. So if the male's the head of household and he's got no kids, the ex-wife or girlfriend's coming over there and smacking him around? Or or, or his, not necessarily his ex-wife. Well, current or whatever, yeah. 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 No, that's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. So maybe she's mad because he doesn't have any kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, something's going on. All right, no letters, please. All right. All right, let's see. Intimate partner violence has been declining. That's the good news. And we know that from the stalker thing. Which have yeah. Stalker has been more reporting going on, but I think the reporting of domestic violence is up uh, because people feel more comfortable now reporting that kind of stuff. Uh, but again, we talked about this uh, before. Uh, every nine seconds in the U.S., a woman is assaulted or beaten. Nine seconds is, uh, Hello. well, we, what did we learn a couple weeks ago? That no, every sorry. every minute there's 100 cell phones yeah. stolen. So this is even more more interesting. Around the world, at least one in every three women has been beaten, coerced into sex, or otherwise abused during her lifetime. Domestic violence is the leasing, leading cause of injury to women, more than car accidents, muggings, and rapes combined. That's frightening, isn't it? Yeah, what else you got in there? Yeah. Nearly one in uh, five teenage teenage girls have um, uh, been in a relationship with a boyfriend, threatened, self-harm. Um, every day in the U.S., uh, more than three women are murdered by her husbands or boyfriends. Domestic violence related. Domestic violence related, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, eight million days of paid work per year in the U.S. alone uh, is lost. Um Due to eight uh, million eight days, million. wow, eight million. That's right, eight million. Right, equivalent of thirty-two thousand full-time jobs are there lost each year. Technically, are lost. Yeah, wow, are lost each year. Well, that's because the woman's in the hospital. She has to stay home with the kids. There's yeah. separation issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that, that's or they just drop and out of the uh, workforce. The cost is about uh, five point eight billion per year for uh, medical and health uh, insurance. Um, and as as we said. In a show before, the uh, we're all going to be paying for that, tax-wise. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it's going to make a huge impact you know, with the affordable yeah. or unaffordable <laughs> care act, as <laughs> I like not, to call I'm it. Not it. Ridiculously <laughs> unaffordable <laughs> care act. No comment. There's the uh, break music. We're going to be back in a minute with our guest, who will discuss uh, some of the causation going on here. What what triggers these domestic violence cases? How we can help victims understand it and reduce some of these rates. Back in a minute on Security Guy Radio. Welcome back to Security Guy Radio with Chuck Harold and Paul Bristler. Talk about domestic violence today. We ran a few stats the first segment, uh, the impact on society and families and costs. It's just it's beyond comprehension, really. Terrible. And something has to be done about it. So our guest today may have a solution to help victims cope with this. My guest is uh, Rebecca Mahan. She's the author of the book Vote, V-O-T-E, that's Victims Overcoming Traumatic Events. And uh, Ms. Rebecca has spent over 15 years studying domestic violence and working with victims of various traumatic events. She's been employed for over 10 years now. Uh, 10 years, correct? Almost 10. As a law enforcement officer and has been a field training officer for, for over four years. She obtained her California Basic Post uh, Certificate, Intermediate and Advanced Certificates, holds a private investigator license. Uh, she's been a published columnist for over five years and uh, is also a United States Marine Corps veteran. Well, congratulations. Thank yeah. you for your service. Thank you. Where were you stationed? 
um, in California primarily. Very good, very good. How long did you serve? I did what's called the six by two, six active, reserve, two inactive. Oh, okay. right. I was activated during uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, yeah. but I didn't go overseas. I was very fortunate yeah. that I didn't have to see some yeah. things. Yeah. So you got some, you got some uh, life cred. I do. Life cred. I do. <laughs> Little business background here. So you you use this, you, you combine your knowledge and experience to kind of create this program for domestic violence. And we've talked in a, another segment about the program where law enforcement uses it to respond differently. And in short, instead of law enforcement showing up, putting the cuffs on the be- on the husband or wife and taking them to jail and going to court and testifying, the law enforcement module with vote where this was done uh, has a police officer responding in follow-ups. The same police officer handles the call. He comes back a week later, comes back a couple weeks later, over a period of four initial weeks and then three months and a year, we're building rapport with those victims, and the victims are more likely to talk about what happened. Uh, they're more likely to respond appropriately. And importantly, when this program was put in place in Sutter County, correct, Shutter, in the Sutter County, Sheriff's. Su- Sutter County Sheriff's, rubber baby buggy bumpers, I, it's kind of hard to say, uh, put this in place, there was a 97% reduction in police officers returning to a known domestic violence residence. Correct. In other words, they came once, they, they did the program, three or four weeks, they didn't go back again, and everybody lived happily or unhappily ever after. Maybe they got divorced, but law enforcement didn't have to come back and respond to additional violent episodes. They responded with counsel, well, not counseling, but they responded with follow-ups, making people know that they're there and watching it reduce the violence. Correct. So right. And it offers the victim and the family a support system. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I read this book. It's not It's not very long. I mean, this is, uh, it, you know, it's about 50 pages. It's It's very quick reading, but it's such common sense. This is what I took out of it. It's common sense. It is. And, um, the book was primarily written for law enforcement and those who respond first, but any person that picks it up and reads it can apply it to their own life or can assist somebody that they know in domestic violence. It offers the steps that are really necessary to help someone work through an unhealthy relationship and become healthy so that they can have healthier relationships in the future. Mm-hmm. So how do, we, how do we define domestic violence now? So domestic violence can be a number of things. Um, it can be between husband and wife, parent and child, brother, sister. It can be involved in same-sex relationships. Um, So domestic generally has met at home or a cohabitating person, and that's the way law enforcement looks at it, or someone who has been cohabitated. Yeah, back in the old days, I mean, literally, sometimes in some places you had to be married, so on, but that's kind of all out the door now. No, domestic is any type of relationship in my mind. You know what I mean? That's, as far as the way I view domestic violence, if you have a relationship with somebody there, you know, that's your world. That's your home, right? So So how are we defining a victim? And that's not as easy as it sounds, I don't think. It isn't. And a lot of people prefer to use the word survivor, but um, generally speaking, so everybody is familiar with the term victim, it's somebody that has been um, exposed to some type of a negative, unhealthy, or even traumatic event, and it has affected them. Would you d- would you define, let's say, in a husband-wife relationship where the husband's the aggressor and punches the wife? I, I, is he a victim? I can't see him as a victim, but I when I read the book, I I thought of him as a victim as well. Yes, because he has, um, you know, unhealthy. Behavior. Unhealthy behaviors, yeah. unhealthy thoughts, unhealthy <coughs> things that are causing him to react in the same manner, and he does not know any different if we're using him. Typically, um, domestic violence is, you know, a female-based victimization. Typically, yeah. yeah. Okay. But um, there are a lot of men who are victims as well. And so we're. I take the approach that everybody that is involved has – some kind of negative impact based on the things that are going on within the relationship. And some of us uh, are more sensitive to things that may be not as sensitive to someone else. And so we're going to react differently based on those things that are unique to us. So the aggressor typically is a person that institutes physical violence, but not necessarily. That can be psychological. Or it can be an initiator. Just an initiator. Oh, oh. Oh, this is okay. okay. So, okay. so uh, if if a female is uh, smaller in stature, not as physically strong, she may initiate a form of the violence by, you know, criticizing or being upset or you know whatever it is. 
So you could call her an initiator, not a victim. Well, she became a victim after from a physical as well. No, the, 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 who is eventually the victim, but started so it, that, starts that's it from a physical point of view. That's where things have, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of have a blurry line here as far as when it comes to law enforcement. If we were to go back into uh, talking something about in that respect, um, but there are situations where someone does initiate something. It causes someone who does not know how to react very well into a physical confrontation, and then you have a person that's a physical victim. Right. Yeah. Okay, and then the person who it was this it, it secondary in nature ends up being the one that goes to jail or something like that. But um, everybody has a responsibility in what's going on within the relationship. Right. They should also be accountable for their own actions. And um, there is nothing acceptable about hitting somebody. I, d- I just want to throw that out there. Absolutely. There is yeah. nothing acceptable. I'd like to say that that should be the same with things that we say to one another. But we tend to say a lot of things um, to the people that we love more negatively than we do a stranger. No, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And for my nine sisters that are listening out there, please, no emails <laughs> about mm. how I think you initiated a fight. Okay. <laughs> I'm with you. I get it. All right. So uh, let's talk about the domestic violence cycle. This is a very interesting uh, process, really. It's a process. And when I say domestic violence cycle, I think we can all think about our regular relationships, uh, married or otherwise, that don't have any violence in them, but we have patterns, we have cycles. We do the same thing with our significant other all the time in the same way, and that's a cycle as well. We do. Right. So, But when violence comes into play, uh, it's even more uh, dynamic. So let's talk about how that cycle starts, beginning, middle, end to it. Ends usually somebody's dead or very, very hurt, or they're going to jail, really. So as I'm going into this um, particular uh, description of the domestic violence cycle, I'd love it if your listeners could get out a piece of paper and a pen, maybe even you, so you would be able to understand um, as I share this with you. So the domestic violence cycle basically is in three phases. So you have the honeymoon phase where... And this is, I don't want you to start on this, just have it ready, but um, the honeymoon phase where everything's going good. Things are flowing joyfully back and forth between the partners. People are excited. They're at peace. Love is in the air. Everything's great. And then comes the tension building uh, portion of the cycle. And during this phase, things begin to build up, build up. You know, you have things that are irritating you or maybe them and there's arguments that are starting to come about and things just get very, very tense within the relationship. And at some point there's an explosive stage and initially it's probably not physical. Mm -hmm. Initially it's probably verbal. So there's going to be an argument and some things that are going to be said that are significant enough to make the other person feel really bad, maybe guilt, um, Self-esteem wise, there could be things, but there's going to be a targeted unhealthy remark that's going to be very significant. And over time, the cycle continues. So they'll make up, they go through the, you know, everything's great for a little while, they go through the tension building stage again, and then an explosive stage. It can last in that same manner with the arguments and response for a certain period of time. Could be a couple months, could be three months, a year, whatever. Depends on the couple. And how they respond and what they have brought in to the relationship it could take years but over time at some point this cycle is going to grow into a a larger explosive period less of a honeymoon and a greater tension period does that make sense yeah do you see sort of damage to property coming in at any point like you know know, the the aggressor sort of smashing up the household or that can happen. I mean, does, and that, I does that move in at one specific point or can it happen, you know, during the whole period? It can happen initially. Yeah. Well, I, be I've always been interested to know if people <coughs> just decide one day to say pass the salt and explode or, you know, pass the salt becomes more and more of an aggressive statement and the other person reacts to it and it kind of escalates. But then I've seen, you know, the, like the lady with the steak knife in her husband's head who just got tired of talking to him and stabbed him and there wasn't any preceding violence in it. It was just she had it. You just don't so know where somebody's you know where it's gonna snap, yeah. point of explosion is. You know, you don't. You don't know what kind of situations they've been involved in before. If they come from a domestic violence home, 
I, I would say that a large number of people that are currently involved in domestic violence came from a domestic violence yeah. type of home. Not may not have been physical. It could have been emotional or a mental type of violence at home, but there is something. The majority of relationships that we get involved with, um, we represent the behaviors that we learned at home because that's where our boot camp is for yeah, yeah. learning how to have a how relationship. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, how often is law enforcement involved in uh, domestic violence? If it's underreported, law enforcement's probably not going to most cases. Correct. Right. And most of the time, people at home want their business to stay at home. Uh, law enforcement may respond because a neighbor heard uh, verbal threats, a crashing sound based yeah. on the furniture, like you said a little while ago. There could be any number of different things that will cause law enforcement to come out. But usually, it's usually when there has been something very explosive happen. Do you, do you see a, uh, we was looking at these stats and, and there seems to be a difference between what we was reading in regard to age. I mean, on some stats, it looks like 20 to 24 and then we're reading others and it's, you know, 35 to 50, 45. Do you, do, I mean, do you see a particular age, you know? Uh, I wouldn't there? necessarily say that there's a particular age. Um, in fact, it's getting younger because of the dating. Uh, oh, because yeah, yeah, yeah. people are dating younger, so they're right. Oh, that's interesting. And there's a lot of a lot of violence in in um, teen relationships. Yeah. So, all right. Well, when we come back. We're going to talk about why victims just don't get out of relationships, and you're going to find some very interesting answers to that. Back in a minute on Security Guy Radio. <laughs> Welcome back to Security Guy Radio with Chuck Harold and Paul Bristow. Talking to Rebecca Mahan, author of Vote, V-O-T-E, that's Victims Overcoming Traumatic Events, a primer to be used for law enforcement and victims alike. And today we're talking about the victim side of using your uh, program and methodology. So the question I have is, why don't victims <coughs> just get out of these relationships? And that's oversimplified. Again, my nine sisters, please no emails. I get it. But it is a good question. I think everybody else is. Well, and I think, right. you know, if, if I was smacked, no my person, I would be, that's it, I'm out. Yeah. That's just me, right? But that's I'm a different personality. So try and help us understand that. And give us something that the victims can use to understand why they do it themselves. Okay, victims, I, let me just go back. People that are involved in situations that we think is very simplistic uh, can be very complex for people who are actually in a situation where they're being victimized and in just about every case that I can think of and I'm going to say everything I, my belief is that it's going to be a fear-based issue so a people fear, a fear based, based issue so you're, you're suggesting that people's responses in domestic violence cases are fear-based right most of us will not want to admit that okay. but as I explain that um, maybe you can see the do you, correlation. Think, do you think sometimes also, you know, the person has got, you know, still these deep feelings towards somebody so that that adds to it? Well, you can love someone away? very much and not you know, dream that everything is going to be okay. Most of us as and women are nurturers and we're trying to make everything okay. Yeah. We're raising our family and so we want to, we want to, you know, do something, you know, that will change those things. So yeah. you're saying on both so sides of, a, of, a, of, of an relationship and domestic violence that fear is the driver in people's responses and interactions with each other yes okay, and that so will carry that. over to any any situation that you have and that's why this applies to trauma or any any oh, type not, of negative not or just the domestic violence correct okay so so prove yourself okay let's so let's let me go back to the the original question is why people don't leave and a number of reasons are there some have to do with religious reasons you know they made a vow before god and they're going to keep that vow good point uh could be that they have nowhere to go or they financially can't get out 
or if they left, they have to explain it to their family members or coworkers or something like that. So there's a number of, and there could be many, many other reasons. That's not something that is just one simplified answer for one, for every person, but it would be a fear-based issue. And, um, sometimes even though. So in other words, the fear of humiliation within the family, the fear of being financially destitute, the fear of uh, living on your own or whatever. Those are fear driven. It makes sense. Yeah. And and obviously the fear of of the aggressor, you know, severely harming you. Correct. And that's another, that is definitely another aspect. And that's why many people don't get restraining orders. And I'm not one that actually advocates it all the time. I I say that there's specific incidences instances where that can be effective but generally that is um the last stats i saw on restraining orders sorry the last stats i saw on restraining orders was that the only ones that truly work are mutual restraining orders oh that's okay. interesting 100 percent okay. of the time mutual restraining orders work well, that makes sense well, in Calif- the rest of them are sort of up and down mm-hmm. yeah. in california um if a person gets if they happen to be the subject of a restraining order, their rights get taken away. So their guns are coming out of the yeah. home. Um, there's certain certain things that are going to, you know, happen to them that is not a pleasant thing. And so the person that is the subject of the restraining order generally uh, can get angry. And this becomes a very, very yeah. dangerous situation <laughs> for the person that actually took the restraining order out. So I think that there's other methods that can be used, but you have to understand from, you know, where this is at, what the fear is and how you help the person and what is individualistic to the person's fear. So I shared with you earlier that, um, for your listeners to get a piece of paper and a pen, and I'm going to give you an example. Is now the time? Now's the time. Okay. I'm going to do it. Well, should we insert some, uh, Brian, do you have any, uh, Jeopardy (laughs) music we can play while people get it out a piece of paper? Okay. That's fine. I think that's enough time. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> All right. We got the paper. We're ready to go. All right. So okay. show us what we're going to do. Today. So what you're going to do is you're going to draw a circle in the middle of your paper. Draw a circle in the middle of my paper. Okay. Put a dot right in the middle. Got it. Of the circle. Got it. Okay. So the dot represents you. And so okay. we're going to talk about us uh, as this is our life because we don't want to say you or them and separate somebody who's going through a situation versus us who Mm. appear to be perfect. So we're all in this together, if you will. This particular dot is me. That's it's me and it's Paul and Oregon. Okay. So in that circle is your world. And so you can scribble in it all around the little dot and you can see that that's everything that you know and is comfortable for you. Okay. That's my comfort zone. That is your comfort zone. Okay, so now we're going to ask a victim to get out. Why don't you just get out? So Le- leave your circle. Leave your circle. So what happens? Draw a line from your dot to the outside of the circle and stop right when you get out. So what happens when you reach that point? It's a I, big void. I don't have anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and that's yeah. fear of the unknown. Yeah. And generally speaking, we as individuals, we don't know what's coming up. We have all these different fears. What if I can't afford this? What if, What's going to happen? What is he going to do? What is she going to do? How am I going to support the kids? There's a number of different fears. Could be anything. Yeah. So what happens to the person at that point when they're outside that circle and they start experiencing those things and they don't have answers to address those fears? They're going to go back in the circle. That's exactly yeah. what happens. And that is how, how and why they stay. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So for those of us that are assisting people. How or why they stay based on whatever their justification is, but right. the nexus of the of the, the the motivation of them doing it is that fear of, I, I don't know what to do next. Right. So I'm going to go back to what I know, and if that means getting hit in the head with a frying pan, that's what I'm going to go back to. That's exactly right, yeah. because at it's least I know what's going to happen. Than this. Yes. Yeah. Right. I know yeah. what's going to happen. I yeah. know how I'm going to deal with it. I know that, you know, if it means that, he or she is going to walk out the door or they're going to do this or that X, Y, and Z is going to happen. I know it and I'm, and I can deal with it or at least I think I can, even though they don't realize that there's an explosive phase that's coming. That's even worse than the one that they've experienced before. It's just when, so to assist victims, it's identifying what the fear is. So if someone were to tell me that it was a religious fear, then I might seek, you know, the Bible and discuss with them the different things, um, that, 
are pertinent to their concerns within that that frame. Mm. So you're going to frame each fear and address that. And how a person can help themselves without having to share with this with someone, let's say they're at the beginning of the stage or um, something like that, is to begin to identify within themselves what it is that they're afraid of and figure out what resources are available to get them to work on overcoming that particular fear or objection that they have. This is super important in in reaching this. So when people are in the fear phase, are they expressing this fear to the domestic partner? Are they saying, you know what, I, I think I should divorce you. I just can't because... Well, probably not. My no. family's going to be upset with me. I mean, they're they're going to change that behavior into what? Yelling, screaming, well, accusations, what? That's exactly what's going to happen because more than likely, we don't know what our fear is. It's a subconscious thing, and we're, re- we're reacting with a defensive mechanism. Yeah. So it's really trying to take the time and figure out what's going on within ourselves or within someone else and addressing that particular issue issue that fear-based concern that they have it, there's nothing wrong with having a fear and being scared none I, I just really want to put that out there because most of us will def- dismiss that and be defensive saying I'm not scared of anything and that's not true well I you know I can relate to that I I'll tell you one thing that just made me apoplectic when I was a, a younger parent when my kids were little right go to the grocery store go to Disneyland whatever it is and my cop background makes me more aware of bad things in the world so I would say listen Stay where you are. Stay close to me. If you're going to do something, if you're going to move, just tell me about it. And guess what they do? I turn around, they're gone. And they're gone at Disneyland one day. All right? Megan's, uh, the fireworks go off, Megan's gone. And we can't find her. And they shut the whole park down, and we looked for two hours. And I went back to my training, and I said, you know what? Always go back and start at the beginning. And I went right back to where she was, and she had moved two feet around a wall because oh, the crowd right. pushed her, <laughs> but she did exactly what I told her in state. Started, but while yeah. I was looking for her, I had a combination of absolute gut-wrenching fear and anger. Mm-hmm. And I was angry because she had not followed what I taught her to do. She turned out she did, right? Right. Now, why I turned that into anger, I, maybe anger helps you get through it. Maybe anger helps you survive. I don't know. But I definitely translated a feeling of absolute helplessness into anger. No right. doubt about it. Right. No doubt about it. Very interesting concept. All right, back in a minute on Security Guy Radio with uh, Miss Rebecca Mahan of the VOTE program, Victims Overcoming Traumatic Events, here on Security Guy Radio. Welcome back to Security Guy Ready with Chuck Harold and Paul Bristow. Paul Bristow. Paul Bristow. We're talking to Rebecca Mahan, author of Vote, V-O-T-E. That's Victims Overcoming Traumatic Events. Now, we were talking at the break. I've got to first say, what? I love this circle idea. I've never seen that before. That makes perfectly but, good and, sense. Uh, yeah. That was just great. Yeah. I mean, what I'd like to get to so, by the end of the segment is how do we get people out of that circle into a new circle? Let's okay, try, let's, let's talk let's try about do that. that. So but but I, I wanted to bring up something in the book over that was very interesting. So here's a typical issue, and I think all relationships. Uh, my son, the uh, the user of tuition, I will call him, all right, when he was in high school decided, uh, I have some testosterone now. I don't have to let uh, dear old mom and dad know uh, where I'm going and what I'm doing exactly. He had, a, he had a time to be home, and we were pretty good about that. But a lot of times he just absolutely ignored a simple rule was, I just want a phone call that says, I'm on the way home from point A to point yeah. B, and I'll be there. And when he didn't do that, I really became very upset about it, right? And I was angry about it. And in fact, what I was angry about was not anger. I was just worried he was hurt. That's right. all I was. I was yeah. just worried he was yeah. hurt. It was a fear base. It was fear base, but, yeah. I, was, but I would translate it into uh, anger at him. Because he didn't get me saying, oh, I love you. Please come home on time. Son, father thing didn't work out that way, right? And I know on calls, you know, you can screw things up with assumptions, right? So you cite a thing in the book where, let's say, a police officer goes out to a domestic violence case. 
And the wife's very upset, yelling and screaming. And what, what started this argument? Well, he didn't come home. And, you know, he doesn't call me. He doesn't come home. And I was really mad about it. And I think the sample you said was the police officer said, oh, well, uh, ma'am, are, are, are you worried that he was, you know, having an affair? <laughs> she goes, uh, no, I hadn't crossed my mind. But now that you mentioned it, and what she was really afraid of is that he was injured. Mm. Right. But she took her fear of him being injured, just like in my case, and turned it into anger. And when you are angry with somebody, you get anger back. That's just the that's bottom right. line. That's right. It's just And physics. that's fear, too, because that's, is the person one-upping me? Do I look bad? That's right. I mean, there's a number of different reasons. But when anger is presented to us, we usually are defensive, and there's a reason why. You're straight-up defensive the second time you're angry. It's, yeah. it's survival. I mean, you don't know what this guy or woman's going to do when they throw anger at you, so you have to, be, you have to put up a bigger front Make you yourself do. appear larger and more dominant than the other person. Otherwise, they're going to get you. You do. And you can utilize this. Uh, you know, I, I challenge you over the next week or so to see if what I'm sharing with you regarding fear-based issues, um, in fact, is the case. And you can do this very, very easily. And then once you see that this works, you can apply it in any type of relationship you have, whether it's with your bosses, coworkers, husband, wife, children, whatever. How about a, a uh, co-host on a radio show? You You've got nothing to fear. From no, me. I was afraid, engineer, <laughs> engineer Brian. What was I afraid of today? That, uh, well, that you Paul's got the fact that I'm more handsome and obviously got better that, dulcet that tones. That Paul wouldn't show up. Right? <laughs> I was afraid of that, and, and I, that Paul would be louder than you. And Paul would be. Oh yeah, louder that's right. Than me on the radio, I was yeah. afraid of that. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, no, no. I, I'm, okay. I'm half kidding, yeah. okay, but it's true no, because but it's, I, yeah. yeah. But we, I we said we were going to meet at like four o'clock or something yeah. to get coffee, and now it's four o'clock, it's five o'clock, it's six o'clock, and I'm going, where's Paul? Where's Paul? Where's Paul? And well, I mean, so. I wasn't angry at you, but you know what I'm saying? It 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 does well, translate. You didn't answer your text. So let me See, that's the problem. No, it's true, but if you, this, you can apply these text, things to. Uh, I'm not mad about that. <laughs> no, I, no, but that that. And there's a, that would be a fear-based statement. Yeah. No, it's. Yeah. It is, seriously, it yeah. is. You know why? I'm totally serious because <laughs> what can happen in this yeah, situation no, is if he and I aren't communicating properly as, as radio hosts, right? And I think he's supposed to be here at 6 and he's late and he, I didn't get the texts. I didn't pay attention. Then we're not on the air and it's a big problem. And the right. problem or, with that is that we normally talk hourly. Uh-huh. That's true. Most days, right? And if yeah. he's upset, <laughs> his statement was that you weren't getting the text messages. That's yeah. correct. So that would be, yeah. it could That's have right. been... Back to this, well, did something pa- happen to him? He paid for that because the text message was actually, I mean, Starbucks, what do you want? And you <laughs> oh, I miss my coffee. <laughs> <All right>. oh. <laughs> so there you go. Okay, so <laughs> it's not just anger, though. It can be any type of comment that is um, negative. All right, so okay. yeah. give me another example. So, so let's say you're at the grocery store, and the person behind you starts complaining. Give me something that would a typical person would Oh, I do it all the time. Okay. I'm that guy. Okay, so let's The line's let's too long, and this guy is taking, you know, 25 minutes to return his dollar twenty-five toothbrush, and he doesn't have the coupon. He's got to find the coupon in his pocket, and Grandma's holding up everything. I just go wacky. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out, you know, why is this guy making all these comments? So I would, you know, I go say, by the first statement. I'm the, that I'm the guy. I'm the crazy old guy that says... Why are we opening up another cashier? What's everybody Which is doing? a good point. Why yeah. aren't people working? Why do I have to stand in line for 20 minutes? What's going on? And I, I don't go crazy on and screaming, but I'm not happy about it. So if I were going to try to find out what your issue was, I, I would ask you, um, you know, your fear-based issue. I would just, you know, start a question uh, in asking, and this is what you could do to yourself as well, but asking yourself, so um, are you upset because you're not going to get out of here on time? I, you know, if I think about it, I'm probably upset because... Wasted time. Yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, I've been shot at. Incompetence. I've been shot at. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've had a lot of near-death experiences, and I just think time's precious. I really do. So any time wasted on something silly as incompetent cashiers, I just, it's crazy, but I don't like it. Right. So we just start asking questions until we figure out what the fear yeah. is. I, right. And my question may not have any been anything to do with your fear but you just told me what it was yeah okay so um we can do that with ourselves as well so i would challenge you and your listeners if they wanted to start uh working on issues that they can overcome it's identifying fears and not only with the people around them but with themselves and it can start by doing this at the grocery store well in a domestic violence situation if my initial response is to be frustrated or angry or sarcastic Right yes. in a response, yes. or I'm not sure whatever other response there is, but if I examine where it's coming from and we boil it down to fear, how do you how do I change my language? 
I, I'm just going to say, uh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid that this is going to happen. And that's why I'm, or, you know, that's why I was angry. You can apologize, but you can. How do you how do you not escalate in the first place by identifying what your fear is? Yes, and then picking another way. And I'm saying picking, you know, using a different choice in how you are going to handle this situation. So we know generally in a relationship because we're patternistic people that we're going to argue about some of the same things. And so knowing that certain issues happen to be presented in a relationship time and time again, you can begin to say, okay, here's something, you know, that I can do that will change that. My response is going to change that. One thing that most of us don't want to do is change us. It's kind of like, why do I need to change me? They're the one with the problem. Makes sense. Yeah. The other person should change, right? But we need to change us and other people's response to that is going to change. And one of the ways you can do that is take out another piece of paper. Okay. okay You're increasing is, my budget for the show, you know, by doing this. Okay. Go ahead. So um, this one, your listeners and you or um, anyone that wants to begin getting healthy uh, should take this with them wherever they go until they get uh, really uh in a habit or a pattern of being able to identify the fears and where this is going to go. So um, on your sheet of paper, you should write in all capital letters the word healthy. Okay. And draw a line underneath that. And then in capital letters, unhealthy. Unhealthy. All right. Mm -hmm. So whenever a situation comes up, and a person is not sure how to respond to it. They think they're going to say certain things or they're going to react a certain way. They can ask, ask themselves, is this healthy or unhealthy? So give yourself a, some type, give me a question and I'll show you how this works. Uh, I don't have a question. I'm feeling okay, afraid. so is that healthy or unhealthy <laughs> for your listeners? <laughs> no, it's unhealthy. She got me. It's unhealthy for me not to have a question. Okay, so if you it's a talk okay, radio so that's show. unhealthy. So Touché. you can't do that. Uh, yeah. I can't do you that. You have to have a question. Yeah. I have to okay. Yeah. So Good point. Oh, you okay. have to be quick. All right. Right. So you can do this with just about anything. <laughs> that's and, a great example. And if it falls in the unhealthy category, you just absolutely cannot do that. Right. Yeah. So uh, if your reaction normally is to no be no dead to him. no dead airtime. Okay, right. Okay, that's yeah. unhealthy. That's so a fear-based issue. I can't have downtime on the air. There's definitely fear. All right. Yeah. Okay. If it falls into healthy, go ahead and do it. It's totally Makes okay. Sense. That's what you need to do. And this will help you keep on track. It, you really need to write it down. It, don't type this out. <clears throat> this needs to be handwritten, and then you need to keep it in your wallet or by your mirror or whatever. And any time a situation comes up that you want to address, start asking yourself, is this healthy or unhealthy? Well, one of the, I mean, we've only got a short time left, but one of the things that you've, that you've heard in the past uh, in regard to domestic violence is always the aggressor is control-based. They're the person that's got to control all the time. I mean, how do you deal with that side of it? It's going to be the same thing. Okay. Because you want to find out why they feel that need. Okay. If you feel like you have to be in control, most of us know. Um, well, I got an idea. Yeah. So if we're, if I'm a victim in a domestic violence case where the aggressor is keeping me down and I can't get out of it, and I look at the healthy unhealthy scenario, and it's unhealthy for me to get upset back because then I get more aggression. Maybe I change my behavior a little bit. Correct. Maybe I start talking to the person instead of yelling. How does this help me get out of the circle? i got to get out of the circle in one minute, so go. How do I okay, get out of the so circle? Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to start seeing if something's healthy or unhealthy. If it's unhealthy, you can't be there, so you have to find an alternative method. And if that means seeking outside resources, that's what you do. We have to go out of our comfort zone to that's do that. That's right. You have to do that. And as you go out of your comfort zone and you are making these changes into the healthy, guess what happens? Now take your pin to the edge of where that that line was on the outside of that circle and make that the starting point of the next circle. Oh, okay. well, that's a good yeah, point. Okay, good point. and yeah. it's going to expand. Right. And yeah. eventually, those other things, your, your comfort, comfort zone just gets bigger and bigger. So, domestic violence uh, victims or participants, uh, I'd recommend this book. It's a quick read. It's very interesting about overcoming our traumatic events. It's called Vote, V-O-T-E, Victims Overcoming Traumatic Events by Rebecca Mahan. Uh, website, uh, voteprogram.com. Correct. You prefer the email. Okay, and your email address is? Program at yahoo.com. Full program at yahoo.com, published by Author House. It's a great little book. Yeah. Rebecca, this is very interesting. I hope this has been helpful to our uh, our victims and aggressors, by yeah. the way, Thank of you. domestic yeah. violence. Hopefully they can use some of these techniques what, to what lower their aggression. Yeah. Yes, exactly. All right. Back uh, next week for another 
what can we call it? Should we say effervescent or uh, no? I said that. How about? Uh, did you say effervescent? I said effervescent today, didn't I? Yeah. No, some other word. Uh, well, we'll figure out what the word is. It'll be another exciting show, of Security Guy Radio. We'll see you next time. Be safe.